Um, so, yeah, first of all, a few disclaimers about this presentation. Um, this is a very biased presentation. This is our own perspective from Up42 and how we dealt with things. It doesn't mean it's the right answer or this is the best answer, but it's what we have to, to work with. And it's also biased because it's my perspective. This is how I felt was important and I chose to, to present you here today. And also the work that I'm displaying here is not only mine, but it's the whole team. There's like a bunch of very talented people that work to uh, develop what we had there. So to start, we're going to be talking about the console today, and this is the main front-end application that we have, and it deals with, well, a lot of what App42 has to offer, so ordering data from the catalog, getting tasking, managing your data, processing, and all of that, this is handled in the, the console. Um, this is our tech stack. We have one React application, it's one monorepo that is um, managed by several domains, so we have multiple teams that work on it. This means that we can work in parallel without interfering with each other that much, but it is one app with TypeScript, because obviously TypeScript. Um, we use Material UI with some modifications because we have our own custom component library that's based on it, so it's not 100% material, but it is close enough. We have lots of good stuff from that and some custom components that we built ourselves. And Leaflet, this is the part that is most relevant today because this is our, uh, how we handle our maps in our application. Everything is Leaflet, and this is what we're using for now. Uh, and here, maps is not that relevant. This is just for the base tiles, uh, just for the, the basic maps. So, but that's, that's where we get our tiles from. So that's that. This is a screenshot of the catalog. So here's where you can order uh, existing data from multiple providers that we have. You can move around the map and get, draw your own AOIs and get this data. Um, that's tasking, same deal, but here is for data that doesn't exist. So you're pretty much asking a satellite to take a picture for you. And that's how you do it. And this is just a screenshot. I just drew this nice little square there for presentation, and this is the data management. That is the part that I actually work with. This is from the data that you actually have uh, purchased already, regardless from where, and this is where you actually use it, where you can download it, run processing, or do whatever it is that you do with your data. So, on to the challenges, and I'm gonna start with the biggest one, I guess, that is more relevant, that is actually displaying GeoTIFF data on the map. So this wasn't uh, super easy. So this is what it means. So of course, when we get the stack items, we don't only want to see the polygons, but we want to see what the data actually looks like. So see the pixels and all the different bands and all that. And we have GeoTIFFs, so why not just load them and just show them on the map right away? Which was what we tried first, but it wasn't that easy. So we use this uh, library called GeoRaster Layer that, is, um, that works together with Leaflet, but we had many issues with it. So this is, we figured out that it was kind of niche. There wasn't, uh, this wasn't evolved enough to be really used, and there was no real obvious solution. This is for Leaflet, by the way. Uh, other other libraries might be able to handle that much, much better, but at the time, with Leaflet, it wasn't really doable. We had problems with projections. There was only one that it really liked. The others, it was really bad. Um, we had to deal with sign URLs as well. That was a bit uh, of an issue too. And also the null pixel. So the transparency wasn't handled properly. So we had some issues where some black pixels that was inside the image was also transparent and that's not exactly what we wanted. Um, we're not really using this solution anymore, but I would like to show this piece of code here, mostly because the comment that no one added there. So yeah, we lazy loaded this component because the library was just too big and we didn't want to include that in the bundle. And so since it was just a few pages, then we decided to do that. And also this library didn't uh, give us errors when things were wrong, especially for projections. I think there were some other issues as well. So we just had a timeout. If it didn't work in 15 seconds, then we just give up and just saw a random error. So yes, this wasn't the best solution. And this was solved by uh, backend. So they built a Tyler service, and now everything is fine. 
we just get PNGs, and these are just tiles that we can render on the map, no problem. So we are really not um, displaying directly the, the geotiffs on the map. Okay, so some more issues with polygons and interactivity. This is some issues that we have, uh, that we have multiple deliveries that share the same, um, the same polygon, the same area, and they get rendered on top of one another. And of course, this can happen when, for instance, you run some processing on something, and then you have another, uh, you have the original delivery plus the processing on top, and uh, or multiple orders that are the same. Then you have this, and what we did there, we had to create, like only render one polygon, so we grouped all the features that share the same bounding box, which was good enough an approximation for that. It's very unlikely that two polygons will have the same bounding box. And we can see how many of them are overlapping and also that we don't start adding up the transparencies, right? Because if we have multiple uh, polygons and all of them have like 10% transparency, suddenly you have one solid polygon that you cannot see through anymore. So that's how um, we fix that. Another challenge was the size of the polygons. This is especially for um, data management because this is stuff that we already had. And depending on your zoom level, we can't really see those polygons because they would be too tiny. They would be like a pixel in the image and you don't see them. So there is this function that gets when they are just this tiny percentage of the visible area on the map, then they turn into uh, these markers or clusters. This was done, use this, this other library from Leaflet that is called Marker Clusters, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it's, it's not great. Development experience there is a bit iffy and customizing how it looks and click events and all that was a bit challenging. It works, but it's, it, it's not great. It would be nice to have some other solution for that. Um, yes, also for handling the different size of geometry, so selecting the smaller ones. When we get this data from our, our stack endpoints, it returns them ordered, I think, by date, or we might even be able to sort it, but it's not by area. So we had to sort them by area before so that we have the bigger uh, features on the bottom and the smaller on the top, so this way we can select them all um, and this works most of the times. Sometimes there are some weird results when you have some feature that has like a weird polygon, like the first one that I show, because this might have a much bigger area than it looks, and they might end up below some of these big squares. But for most of the time, this works pretty well. Um, well, this is not exactly related to um, stack or polygons or anything, but actually for user, for UI, to have the actual, um, coordinates of the map, the state of the map saved in URL parameters, this helps a lot so that we can share um, when you go to the map somewhere or those, anything in these pages, you can share the URL directly with your team. This helps a lot for QA when they found something that is wrong, they can share with us and we can try and fix it because we can go directly where the problem is. And of course, this is not super easy to manage because we have to keep converting the numbers to strings to arrays and the, so there is all of that. But the end result is pretty nice and it's very useful for customer support as well. Um, also, for customizing these uh, map controls, we, as I said, we have our custom component library and everything is custom designed. So we want to show buttons that look different, add more, uh, more functionality in the map and more elements on top of it. On Leaflet, it's not super easy to, get, to customize the, the elements that are inside and, or also to replace them. You just can't easily replace like a button and, and, and put your own button instead. So we uh, hide a lot of custom uh, of default elements on Leaflet and we put our own and then we just hook into the actual uh, functions of how the map does and then attach that to our button, so we override the whole thing. It's a bit annoying because we have to put everything in absolute position so that it works correctly and it's, it is challenging. But again, the end result works, it's fine. You wouldn't know that uh, the amount of work that went into actually making buttons that, that you can click on, but they are there. Um, 
This is, although this screenshot is not really the best one to display, but when you have some data, you might want to show multiple bands at the same time, one top of one another. This is very useful, for instance, for change detection, where you can see what, what changed from the images that you, that you wanted. In this case, I just picked up some random infrared bands, so they probably look the same. Um, but this is also a bit challenging with Leaflet because there it is very sensitive to the order that you put things and you can't really move items once they are drawn. So if you want to change the order, you have to re-render the list and it would be a bit challenging to go and start sorting things. So right now we can display two layers at once and we get the most recent one on top. Um, but in the future, we might want to be able to drag them, change the order, change transparency, and things like that. But it's not, it's not super easy to, to handle that with Leaflet. Um, and I guess this would be the last issue that, yeah, that anti-meridian, as well, as I learned here in this, in this conference, the word is flat and it's a square, but, um, it's not really a square, right? It is mostly a cylinder when we have this on leaflet because both sides, they connect uh, on the end. And what happens is that if we have this area that you're trying to use in our stack search endpoint, then the backend really doesn't like it. And it's, it, it wants us to send some coordinates that are inside that, that box. So what we do here is that we clamp the, the area that is valid because you also have some buffer around it. So we clamp it to some valid areas and we send it to the back end so that it can return some, some data, which is not exactly accurate. As you can see in this screenshot, we're looking at the whole Pacific and there is the entire United States there and there is nothing, even though we have plenty of assets in the United States. So we can only see this tiny one in Shanghai and there's probably some other, um, I don't know, in Europe somewhere that would be on the buffer. So, yeah, that is kind of a challenge. Um, and the solution for it, of course, would be to split this into the po two polygons, either in the front end or in the back end, to figure out when, um, so that the back end can handle it, or do that for the back end when they can allow some results that are out of bounds. But we have not solved this problem so far, because also customers haven't even noticed. I think for most use case, they have their own AOI, so they upload directly the area that they really want to work with, so no one is really just dragging around the map and, and, and looking at things, so their AOIs would work just fine, and there we have no problem. We also noticed that some other platforms have the same problem, so it's not something that only we do it, but it's, it is out there. But just keep it in mind, if your application have the use case that this is important, you might want to look into that. It is, it, and it might be a bit challenging to fix it either in front end or on the back end. So, yes, what's next from us? That's the main thing. We are now ditching Leaflet in favor of Mapbox because, well, it's not that Leaflet sucks or open source sucks or anything like that, but um, I think we've outgrown Leaflet. It's just that it was a very valid solution in the beginning, and this application, it has like, I don't know, five years or something, started as a view application and then was rewritten into React. And we kept a lot of features that we have from the beginning. We kept adding more and more features, and we probably did all we could on Leaflet. So we did some research and realized that probably Mapbox was, uh, had all the features that we have. There would probably be other options, some of them even in this room, but that's uh, the decision that we had, that we made, and um, in any way mean that Leaflet is bad or anything, it was perfectly valid for building, uh, well, for building the entire application. The company is there and it's running and people are using it and they're paying us money to use our application, so it really does work. But at some point, we need to get something that is more robust and where we can easily use like vector tiles and use elevation and do a lot more than the combo that we have with leaflet and here maps 
can provide. And uh, with that, one extra takeaway that, that I have from this is that while well, software is always evolving, that's, you, you can do whatever you can today, but it's gonna be obsolete later, in five years, in six months, in one year, it doesn't matter. So whatever you do now, you probably should be aware that things will change. You will have to rewrite things again, and then again, and then again, and then you retire. That's kind of how it works with all software. There is no way to just get the perfect one, and also you cannot really be too attached to any solution that you, that you invest in, because in a few years, there might be something better. There's, I'm pretty sure there are people right now working on something that will make whatever decision that we make stupid uh, in the next few years, but that's that. That's what it is, uh, working with software development, I guess. So, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So, now we have the opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, thank you for the talk, that was inspiring. I'm maintaining Stack Browser, so I face all the same issues that you oh, yeah. face. <laughs> um, and for example, the idea with like, uh, the area calculation and sorting it is uh, something that I didn't uh, investigate yet, but that seems like a good idea. Um, Pretty much I came to the same conclusion. I ditched D-flat now, or I'm about to do that, and then going, I'm going yeah. to open layers. Um, but I'm wondering, like, um, you, you've chosen Mapbox.js. Um, did you consider MapLibre, and what were the like, differences in, in, in those libraries that led to choosing Mapbox? Yes, that's a good question, and I cannot really answer truthfully because I wasn't 100% involved in this whole process, but we did test a bunch of other libraries, and MapLibre may be on the mix that was tested there, but also we had people in the company that had experience with Mapbox and were very happy about it. And we would also be willing to pay for any solution, especially because we are using here Maps still, so we need the, the base map in any case, we're gonna be paying for those. So Mapbox would also provide that. So that was the decision, and, but as I said, it doesn't mean it's the right one. That's the one that we're making now. Maybe in the future it might prove to not be the best, and then we migrate again to something else. So. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I have one question because a couple of years ago I also had data sets where polygons cross the, uh, the uh, anti meridian like around New Zealand and like in the Pacific. Um, and back then that was a huge pain because a lot of library, like it's not only the, the, the front-end libraries but also like the back-end libraries, like either they tell you that's an invalid geometry or they do things like they basically they mod 180 this and so you basically get the polygon the wrong way around. Um, how do you deal with that? Do you have had this problem? Have you had this problem? Has this become better? Um, I mean, we are using only our internal endpoints, and the problem that we have is that the, our endpoints, they really want the polygons to be inside those bounds. So we kind of have to, to do that. And as I said, we haven't really fixed it. We just noticed the problem. And it took us a while to figure out what it was because the, we get the results and they're just in some other place in the map that you're not expecting. But yeah, I think I, I investigated some to try and, and create something on the front end so that split these polygons, but it is not, it's really not trivial. It is something that, um, yeah, it should be better, and I couldn't find any library or solution that was like that. I, I searched, but everyone was saying this, like, yeah, just try and split the polygons, but you kind of have to do that manually, I guess, which is not great. Um, any other questions? Ah, yeah.
Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, regarding this anti-meridian problem, there is this uh, nice li library called uh, Footprint Facility 1.2, and uh, it really works nice. Uh, for example, uh, with Sentinel-2, tiles crossing the anti-meridian, so I do recommend using it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Good to know. <laughs> More questions? All right, then, um, so thank you again. <laughs> um, applause for him. <laughs>